In this second video, I want to give you a little bit more background information on aerobic cellular respiration, talk to you a little bit about a second metabolic pathway called fermentation, and then we're going to cover the different procedures that you're going to be doing in lab or the tutorials that you're going to be watching. So this reaction that you're looking at here, this chemical reaction can basically be used to summarize um, the different pathways that make up aerobic cellular respiration. So glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation can all sort of be summarized by this one equation. So remember that when we talk about aerobic cellular respiration, ultimately what we're doing is we are harvesting energy in the form of ATP from organic molecules with the help of oxygen. So in our eukaryotic animal cells, if we're going to start glycolysis at the very beginning, we're going to start with a single glucose molecule, C6H12O6. And there, this represents high energy electrons that can be used to make a lot of ATP in that last step of oxidative phosphorylation. Remember, we're doing this aerobically, so this is going to be oxidized. Ultimately, we're going to have to have something that's going to accept those electrons. In, in the case of aerobic cellular respiration, um, it's those six molecules of oxygen that are going to accept those electrons. We also are going to be regenerating our ATP. So remember that ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. When we need energy, we can cleave off one of those phosphates. And as a result, we're left with ADP. So if we're going to regenerate this ADP, we're going ATP, we're going to need to start with some ADP plus those inorganic phosphates in order to ultimately regenerate it to ATP. Now, as glucose is oxidized and oxygen is reduced, we're going to form six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of oxygen. These are kind of what we consider almost like waste products. Um, the cell isn't doing this in order to make CO2 and water. The cell does aerobic cellular respiration ultimately to generate these three, 32 molecules of ATP. Now, remember, in any energy conversion, it's never 100% efficient. Um, most of the time, you will lose small amounts of energy in the form of heat or thermal energy. So we've also included that in our equation here. I've highlighted the 32 ATP in red really as a way to sort of remind myself, to remind you that these, this 32 ATP that's generated from one molecule of glucose is an approximation. And it's also based on sort of what we do in our eukaryotic animal cells. Um, this number will vary depending on the organism that you look at, whether the cell is a prokaryotic or a eukaryotic cell. So I did just want to make sure that I made you aware of that. Remember that the pathways that we talked about, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation, right, we were able to make small amounts of ATP in the first two stages. It was really that last stage where oxygen was necessary that we were able to yield the greatest amount of ATP. Now, why do I tell you this? Remember that when we talked about glycolysis, we said that we could make some small amount of ATP and we really didn't need oxygen in order to make that ATP when glycolysis happened. All right. But we also ended up, when we did glycolysis, making some molecules of pyruvate that could go on if oxygen was present. We'd do the intermediate step. We'd do the citric acid cycle and ultimately do oxidative phosphorylation. Remember that also with glycolysis, we should be making some of those high electron, high energy electron carriers NADH. And that again, given that the cell has oxygen, these could go on to the electron transport chain where they would be oxidized. We'd use those high energy electrons in order to ultimately make ATP. Now what happens, okay, in the absence of oxygen? Well, in the absence of oxygen, what can happen is we can, if we follow glycolysis with a process called fermentation, which does not require oxygen, we can continue to do glycolysis and yield small amounts of ATP. So fermentation, okay, given that, again, we have sort of an absence of oxygen, can follow glycolysis as a way for cells to continue in the absence of oxygen to yield small amounts of ATP. It's basically a way of harvesting chemical energy, right, by doing glycolysis, even though you might not have oxygen present or low, very low levels of oxygen being present. So how does fermentation exactly work? 
In this lab, we're going to use yeast as our model organism to study fermentation. And so normally what yeast will do is if they have oxygen present, they will do glycolysis. They'll follow that by the citric acid cycle and then follow that by oxidative phosphorylation. But what we can do is we can take yeast and we can put them in an, in an environment where we deprive them of oxygen. And when we do that, what will happen is they will only be able to do glycolysis and we will force them to follow that process of glycolysis with fermentation. So when we do that, what exactly happens? Well, what yeast will do is if we give them a sugar source, for example, again, remember glycolysis starts with a molecule of glucose, they will be able to yield small amounts of ATP, okay, our two molecules of ATP, they'll make pyruvate and they will make those high energy electron carriers of NADH. Now, normally, they would oxidize the NADH during oxidative phosphorylation. But remember, that can only happen if oxygen's present. If oxygen's not present, what yeast will do is instead of oxidizing NADH during oxidative phosphorylation, they will take the NADH and they will oxidize it. In other words, NADH will donate electrons pyruvate will accept those electrons and the NAD plus will be recycled so that they can continue to do glycolysis and yield small amounts of ATP. This second step here that where we're taking our NADH, it's being oxidized, pyruvate's being reduced. This is called fermentation. In the process of doing this, the fermentation, the yeast also makes some additional products. They make carbon dioxide and they make ethanol. And so we can actually, in the lab, we can measure fermentation rates by measuring the amount of CO2 that the yeast are making. Now, again, keep in mind, it's glycolysis that actually allows the yeast to make the ATP. Okay, that's where the ATP is made. Fermentation doesn't actually generate the ATP, but what it allows for is by re recycling the NAD+, it allows the cells to continue to do glycolysis to yield that small amount of ATP so that they can continue to try and maintain homeostasis even when they are, you know, deprived of oxygen or oxygen levels are extremely low. So the first experiment that students are actually going to do is they are going to take fermentation chambers that look like this. You're going to have four of these. And ultimately, we are going to take yeast as our model organism, and we're going to examine this process of alcohol fermentation. So remember that yeast can do glycolysis, they can do citric acid cycle, they can do oxidative phosphorylation. But what we're going to do is we're going to take the yeast and by putting them in this fermentation chamber, specifically up in this arm, we're going to deprive them, we're going to take oxygen away. And so we're going to ultimately look and see what happens when we provide them with different sugar sources. So we're going to, in one case, we're going to give them glucose. In another case, we're going to give them lactose. Now lactose is a disaccharide that's composed of both glucose and galactose that are sort of held together by a bond. And we're going to see, we're going to look at the rate of fermentation based on how much carbon dioxide the yeast are able to produce. We're also going to have some controls here. And so I don't want to give too much away, but for example, if you look in this last test tube, right, you're putting glucose in water, you're not putting yeast. So already you should be able to begin to anticipate what might happen in regards to carbon, carbon dioxide production in this fermentation chamber. So once the chambers are prepared, um, ultimately there's going to be an incubation period. After that incubation period is up, students are going to remove the fermentation chambers from a water bath. Um, we put them in a water bath to help sort of speed up the chemical reaction. And what students will be able to do is they'll be able to, up in this arm, they'll be able to see and measure how much carbon dioxide has been produced. And then we'll be able to compare sort of what's going on in each of these individual fermentation chambers. So that's the first experiment that we're going to do. Remember, ultimately what we're looking at here is we're forcing the yeast 
to into an environment that ha that has no action or limited action and so they're going to do glycolysis and then they're going to follow that reaction with fermentation the fermentation is ultimately going to allow them to recycle their nad plus and they're going to continue to be able to do glycolysis and yield that small amount of atp so that they can continue to try and maintain homeostasis now, the second experiment that you're going to do is going to measure oxygen consumption by your model organism that we're going to use here, our peas, um, at different temperatures. So again, we know that different organisms sort of operate and function best under, under certain conditions. And so we know, for example, that peas do aerobic cellular respiration. So we're not going to do an experiment where we try and, you know, determine whether or not that happens. We know it happens. Peas, just like eukaryotic animal cells, have mitochondria. We know they do glycolysis, citric acid cycle, oxidative phosphorylation. But what we really want to look at in procedure 7.2 is under which conditions um, do they do it best? Do they do it at slightly cooler temperatures or do they do it slight at, at, do they do aerobic cellular respiration? that are at sort of slightly higher temperatures. And we're going to be able to do this by measuring how much oxygen they're consuming in order to generate um, ATP through the process of aerobic cellular respiration. So how is this going to work? Ultimately, what's going to happen is you're going to either be watching a tutorial or you're going to be doing this in lab. We're going to use these volometers. And an, a, a volometer is basically an instrument that can be used to measure gas. So in the volometer, we can actually create an environment by putting water in this environment. We're going to fill this about two thirds of the way filled with whatever the water temperature is that we want to look at. So either a cool water temperature or we'd, we would, we're also going to have a second volometer where we're going to put a slightly warmer temperature, that 20 to 22 degree temperature. Then what we're going to do is we're going to have test tubes that we're going to submerge within that volometer. So these test tubes will actually sit down in that water temperature and the volometer is going to allow us to measure oxygen consumption. How is that going to work? Okay, first, one of the things that I'll point out is that in the volumeter, there are going to be three test tubes. Two of the test tubes are going to have peas in them, our model organism. The third test tube, we're actually going to have beads. In each of the test tubes, we want the weights of the peas and the beads to be approximate. So in the first test tube that you that you do put together, again, assuming you're doing this in lab, you're going to count out 30 peas, you'll weigh that, you'll get a weight in grams. The second test tube, we want that weight of peas to be approximately the same. So in order to do that, you might have to put, you know, maybe one less pea in or one more a heavy, you know, maybe one more pea in order to, to obtain similar weights. Same thing with the beads. We want all of the weights to be approximately the same. Once we have the peas or the beads in there, and again, think about this, the beads are, are sort of our control test tube. We don't expect the beads to be doing aerobic cellular, cellular respiration. We're going to put a little piece of cotton down, and then we're going to put a chemical called soda lime. What the soda lime will do is it will actually absorb carbon dioxide that's produced by the peas as they're doing aerobic cellular respiration. We know that if carbon dioxide accumulates in the test tube, that it can skew our results. It can also be harmful to the peas itself. So the soda lime is going to remove the carbon dioxide as the peas produce it from the environment so that our results are very accurate. Now, once the test tubes are put together, we're going to put a rubber stopper in each of the test tubes, and you're going to see that there's going to be two sort of pieces of rubber tubing that come out of each of the rubber stopping rubber stoppers. One of the tubings, one of the pieces of tubing has a little closure on it. The other is going to have a the tubing is going to be slightly longer and it's going to attach to a glass pipette. Um, this glass pipette is going to ultimately have a little bit of dye that you're going to put in here. And eventually when you close off the other shorter little piece of tubing, what will happen is that there is sort of a 
specific amount of oxygen that's now in this test tube. So as the peas begin to do aerobic cellular respiration and they're consuming the oxygen that's in here, the dye should move towards the volometer. And there's actually a measurement where you're going to do a second video on this where we show you how to do the math to do the conversions. But there's, we know, and again, this is a standard provided by the company that gives, that we bought the volometers for, for every 14 centimeters, that the green dye moves, that's approximately equivalent to one milliliter of oxygen consumed by the peas. And so do keep in mind that you are going to have to do some math in order to calculate how much oxygen the peas are consuming do during this experiment, okay? Again, that conversion that, you know, for every 14 centimeters of, you know, movement in the green dye is equal to one milliliter of oxygen consumed, that is discussed in your lab book in step 23 of the procedure. So that, that information is there. And again, I would strongly encourage you to watch the math video in regards to how those calculations will be done. Once you have your data, the last sort of procedure that you need to do is 7.3, and it's there that you're actually going to graph your data that you're collecting in 7.2. So we want to use the graph paper that's in the lab book to really graph the relationship between temperature and oxygen consumption. Remember that the independent variable is always going to be graphed on the x-axis and the dependent variable is always going to be graphed on the y-axis. So do make sure that you're properly labeling your graph and also make sure that your data points are really showing the relationship between temperature and oxygen consumption because that graph should really help you to see how those two um, are related and really should help you to analyze your data and draw significant conclusions.